uh, thank you all for coming to this session. Uh, so I'm Louise Bennett. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the open source and game-based learning developments that we are doing with Kings Online. Um, I won't talk too much about the very basics, just because it's more interesting to talk about the actual things we're doing. But basically, we started this focus on using open source in particular uh, because we worked out that we needed to do things differently from the way uh, things had traditionally been done. We needed to work more quickly. We needed to try and make things that were uh, different somehow, uh, better than what we'd all traditionally done. Um, and we wanted to improve student engagement wherever possible. So we determined that we wanted to control the tools we use. We want to uh, have control over how we use them, what we do with them, and what's possible. We want to contribute to the communities of the tools that we're using. We have lots of ideas for how to do things that were not, and still aren't in some cases, actually possible. And we really want to be industry leaders, uh, both in terms of delivering online learning, but also in terms of how we're delivering that. So we started then focusing on what we can do to innovate. Uh, so a couple of different areas that we've been looking at is UX and UI. Uh, different authoring tools because we're using Moodle as a platform and Moodle is not a great delivery tool for online learning. It's very much text-based. It's boring um, unless you do something different with it. Um, we've also looked at the workflows of how we work and also at our multimedia and video. So we ultimately chose to start using the Adapt Authoring tool and I'm not going to proselytize about this. It's a tool that works for us. It doesn't work for everyone. It has limitations that we are trying to work around. Uh, and so that comes down to some of the innovation we're doing. We're trying to make it work better for us. Um, but we liked it because it was open source. So we could host it ourselves. And then we could make changes to not just the output, but also the platform itself. Um, we adopted a policy internally that any new um, functions that we add get released open source um, six months after we start using them internally. So the idea there is that not just we're building these new things, but we're then making them available for other people to use them as well and to make their own changes and um, to show us different ways that we could be using them as well so that we can then build on them going forward. Um, there are some exceptions to that. So we build all of our own themes to make um, to brand our learning um, in for a king's um, look and feel, and also faculty specific. We won't release any of our themes open source because those are king specific. Uh, we also um, build various other things internally that won't work externally. So anything that is not going to work stays internally. Uh, for instance, we built an extension to um, make all of our learning objects easily printable. Um, which basically removes all of the fancy CSS and makes it sim simple pages. But so much of that comes down to the way our themes work that we're not going to be releasing that open source because it won't work for other people. Otherwise, we're trying very hard to make things available to everyone um, after we've had some time to use it internally, not just to test it, but also to get some competitive advantage out of our investment. So some of the things that we have been doing, um, for instance, this is a GIF of one of our very old lessons. And we worked out quite quickly that no one could find the, um, that, that that was a navigation bar. No one was clicking on it. Therefore, no one could see that that was actually tracking what they were doing and giving them more information about uh, what um, the ultimate um, output is. So we started to look at how we could improve that to um, help students understand where they are within a lesson and also um, what they need to complete in order to actually complete everything. So this is a lesson from our uh, Masters in Public Health. And as you can see, the menu here is always open. Each box fills as you complete an item, and you can see every page within the lesson at once. So you can then navigate back and forth in between, and you can see that these things still need to be completed. We found that that has made it easier for students to navigate 
our lessons and um, that more students are actually completing all of the components rather than just skipping through. And we can tell more of that information because we're using Google Analytics to um, aggregate what students are doing within each of these lessons. So every time they click a button, print button, use the search, navigate between pages, download a transcript, we're tracking that. It's completely anonymous, so we can't tell which student is doing what, but we can then get a feel for how the students are using our lessons. Um, a lot of them do print the lessons, so that's worth us knowing that we need to make sure everything prints nicely. Um, but equally, um, it looks like most students are completing the whole lesson and not just bits and pieces of it, at least the first time around. Uh, they may then go back and do individual bits and pieces later on. Um, so some stats that we're able to gather, we can see that um, an average lesson in one of our courses um, will be used for about 11 minutes and 30 seconds. Now that's including when someone goes in to just check one thing, so they're only logged into it for two seconds at a time. It also includes the much longer sessions, which we get up to 50 and 60 minutes sometimes if someone is going through it in a very detailed way. Um, that's all really useful information for us to gather. We don't have learning analytics um, at King's yet, um, but this helps us get more information about our students in a way that helps us know how to design the learning that we're trying um, to build. We also know that um, nearly 30% of unique users use a mobile phone or tablet. Now, in terms of actual sessions, it's more like 15% of sessions are conducted on a mobile phone or tablet, but it does suggest that there are a lot of students out there who will use their phone or tablet to look at one thing, even if most of their learning is actually done on a desktop computer. So that tells us that it's important to build things that work on a mobile phone. It's not the most important thing, but um, there are students who appear to be doing a lot of their work on their phone. So that's very important for us to know. So the Google Analytics tracking is something that we have released open source. So anyone who's using the Adapt tool can install this extension and start tracking what their students are doing. So, some things that we've learnt over the past, it's more than 30 months now, I think, but over the past couple of years. Innovation is really expensive. Um, it's not just in terms of time it's, uh, or in terms of actual budget, but in terms of all of the different pieces that you need to use. Every time you build something new, it has to be tested. It has, you have to go through multiple revision stages to make sure it does what you want. And at the end of having used it with students, you then have to determine, is it actually doing for the students what you wanted it to do? Because ultimately, all of this innovation has to come down to, is it making a better experience for the students? Or is it somehow making it easier for us to develop things? Is it making it easier to teach? So there has to be some ultimate goal that is not just, it's pretty and it does something we like. There has to be some actual evidence there. Obviously, Open source has that lovely, oh, it's free, anyone can use it, but we then have to host it ourselves every time the server goes down, which doesn't happen often. It's the server is not student-facing, so it's only going to bother us internally in terms of our development. However, we have to have enough people in the team who can reboot the server if it does go down so that the rest of the team can keep work working. So open source, as the old uh, saying goes, is free as in puppies, not free as in beer. So there's always going to be lots of internal costs related to maintaining it, managing it, making sure that you continue to support it, even after maybe you're not using qu it quite as much, but you still have to make sure it works for the bits where you are using it. It's also enormously expensive in terms of the time internally. Um, thinking up ideas takes a lot of time. Working out how to logistically make them work takes a lot of time. You have to give people space to really think about what it is we're trying to solve, how we can solve it. But innovation is really exciting. I think everyone in the King's Online team 
um, gets really excited when we get to start thinking about things that we can do differently, start work through an idea. Um, but you really have to build that in to the way people work. You need to be able to manage timelines and deadlines because the content has to go out. And if the new idea that we've had hasn't quite come together, you have to then make a decision, are we going to rush ahead with it? We're going to hold back and do it in a way we know um, to, to actually make sure we get things done. And you really have to get everyone on board and excited about things. Testing takes a lot more time than you expect it will. There are always issues that you don't expect it. You need to test it internally. You need to test it with students if you possibly can, which is one of our next steps will be to start actually sitting down with students, whether they're our students or face-to-face -face students, and seeing how they use our content so that we can actually understand if they are using it the way we expect them to, or if they're missing things that we thought were obvious. Uh, you also need to test on different browsers. Is it working on a mobile phone? Is it working on all of the different kinds of mobile phones? Is it working on all the different browsers? It's, there's always going to be those little things that don't quite work the same in every possible system. You also have to think about, is it accessible? We want to make sure that whatever someone's learning needs are, they can access our content, which means that we have to do specific testing for you know, colorblind. Um, you know, there's so many different possible things that people might need, and that is going to ultimately probably take a lot more external work with other stakeholders in the university to get it right. But it's really important to get it right if you possibly can. So after just over two years of developing for open source, we have 13 public repositories that are not forks of someone else's work. So there's a few cases where we have um, made changes to something someone else has released. But in terms of our actual completed projects from start to finish, there's 13 of them. We have 71 total repositories in our um, collection of uh, development work. But that includes things like themes, some of the games that we've built internally, um, forks of Moodle and whatever else that we've been using for testing. So not all of those will ever be released publicly, but there's obviously there's a lot going on behind the scenes in what we're trying to get done. What's next? We'd like to do a really deep review of our UI and UX. We want to make sure that all of our learning is really good, not just good, but great for students. Um, so we will be getting a new um, head of innovation, design and innovation um, in a couple months, and that will be her main um, goal over the next however long is to really make sure that we are delivering learning that works. Um, we're also looking at things like virtual reality and augmented intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, all, all of that kind of thing. Uh, some of our issues there is that um, how do you deliver VR to students who are all around the world when you can't give them all kit? Um, do you assume, you, do you give them Google Cardboard, which does some things but not maybe as much as you'd like? We're still working out the logistics of that, but we think there's a lot of scope there for um, giving improved experiences to our students. And the big one that we're now looking at is game-based learning. So not gamification, which is adding points and scoreboards and whatever, although that is something that we could look at at some point, but actually building self-contained games that support learning. Um, and so as Anna mentioned earlier, we're launching Ludico, which is our game-based learning team down at Cornwall, starting with five roles, uh, with room for expansion. If <coughs> it's a successful initiative, we're going to see how it works over the first year and um, explore further opportunities after that. So the first priority of this team will be game-based learning, and primarily scenario-based. So a student <coughs> does all of their learning online, and once they've got the basics, we have a scenario for them that they can work through to put some of their skills into practice. So it could be um, for an MSc in marketing, they then have scenarios that they're 
head of marketing for a company and they need to, they get given a scenario and they get to make different choices which then have impacts on the relationship with the client, the ultimate product that gets delivered, does it get delivered on time, within budget and so on. So what we really want to do is give students the chance to apply their skills and not just the specific um, skills related to their topic area, but as Anna mentioned, these broader skills for working, so negotiation, problem solving, that kind of thing. We'll also probably look at various other kinds of games um, for language learning, maybe an arcade style game. Still working out really the sky's the limit there in terms of what our academics are interested in doing and what we can do to support our students. Um, one of the big goals there will be to make these games replayable so that you make different decisions, you get different outcomes, so you can really learn from your mistakes a perfect playthrough doesn't mean you're learning as much as an imperfect playthrough. So lots of options there to, to try and give it scope and then to make it framework based so that the technology can then be reused in different ways according to the needs of different subject areas, faculties um, and scopes. So, are there any questions? We're not at the moment, but it's something we may explore. We're still trying to feel our way around it. Absolutely. Yeah, if any information you have, I'd love to hear it. Yes? I mean, I think one of the challenges that we have out in the faculties is that we have ignited a huge amount of enthusiasm amongst academic staff for this kind of thing, and it's how we can keep up with that demand. Yes. With rather than saying in 13 months, because then the enthusiasm is gone. So thinking back over the 13 months, I mean, what would you have done differently in terms of building an infrastructure that could, could cope with that future demand as opposed to growing it as you go along? If I could start everything we've done again, um, there would have been more planning in the beginning for how we're going to do this how we're going to engage with different stakeholders, how we're going to um, e excite people, but also uh, make it sustainable for ourselves. Uh, we've occasionally walked ourselves into corners where we've promised something and then struggled to deliver. So I think it is very much a case of planning everything first, being aware of your own limitations, and trying to not do too many things at once so that you can deliver in a timely fashion for the people you've excited in the short term and then build on that. Um, it's really difficult to maintain enthusiasm um, when you're taking a long time to deliver something and that's absolutely the case. So, yeah. Yes. Um, my question really relates to what Ian has just um, asked and it's really much more of a request than a question. Yes. I was very interested in the luxury of piloting. As you know, we've been through quite a rapid curriculum review. Yes. But it would be a great interest if we could identify elements, modules within a curriculum, and negotiate with you how we could develop a pilot to support them blending in some way. And that, if we could offer small examples it locally, yes. of what we were doing, that could at least keep keep the profile up. Yes. No, that makes a lot of sense. I, I was just wondering, um, what are you doing to sort of support or empower people to take ownership of this themselves, to be able to do this themselves? Um, what training are you providing? Um, what would you provide out there for, you know, for, for fellow people who could start to implement some of this knowledge? That's a good question. Um, that kind of outreach is not yet something we've been doing a lot of. We're trying to do it 
s on a, a small scale with individuals, um, we have a, a lot of issues with people having time to get involved. So we're very happy to share our knowledge. It's actually making sure that people have that time to, to learn from it. Um, but we are always very, very happy to share everything and if someone asks, and we haven't, we haven't yet done the really outreach to say, how can we give you this knowledge? But I think that's something we will need to do more of in the future. I mean, I think that's a really good question, but uh, I'd like you to respond to this, please, Louise. Yep. I think there are two dimensions to it. One is that college-wide, we need a sustainable and safe, secure platform on which to build, and you've talked about what assumptions are we making about how to engage people? What does yes. a platform need to look like? And I, I don't know if I've understood you correctly, but I feel the other element is how do we then support our faculty as well as our students make the most of the resources that are developed? And I don't know that I have a good answer to that really because I think it is a much bigger piece of work to actually inspire more broadly uh, this way of thinking and I think Kings Online has a lot to offer there, but I think it has to be done in conjunction with local tell teams, with the central tell, um, but also to, I guess, to change the way we think about teaching, um, to actually really inspire people to think of how can we teach this differently and what tools are available. So I think one of our big jobs is to raise that profile of this kind of thing is possible how do you want to do it? Um, we only have so much capacity to deliver new and exciting things, but clearly where there's needs, we need to you know, be able to prioritise that and start helping other people to spread this further. I don't know if that really answers your question. But yes. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Uh, sorry, let's do it again. Um, <laughs> Uh, look, one of the things about games, though, and game-based uh, learning is everyone assumes you actually have to convert it into a game. And I think one of the things that is really powerful is for people to start engaging with game-based theory as opposed to just converting everything into a game. Yes. So game-based theory will then say, well, how do you actually go about designing a game? And then uh, it, um, the, the theory behind designing a, well, a, you know, a, a game that actually engages people is exactly the same as what we want in learning and teaching. Yes. Because a, a well a well designed game is just a learning assessment, a learning, a feedback, and assessment activity. That's all it is, and you can apply exactly the same theory, yes. whether it gets converted into a game or whether it's the way we go about doing our um, other business as well. Yes. So something that I think would be useful to engage people with, just to think about um, game based theory from a curriculum design point of view, and take your existing curriculum, take your existing learning activities, your existing feedback mechanism your existing formative and summative assessment and diagnostic assessment and saying, well, actually, how would you redesign all of that um, based around game-based theory? Yes, absolutely. Could I ask you what some of the components of game-based theory are that would be applied? All the things I just said. <laughs> so that is um, learning activities, assessment, yeah. feedback. I mean. Without, look, there, you, you've got good people here who know about games, so they'll be able to follow up with some details. But essentially, we separate by time and space learning, teaching, um, assessment, and feedback, um, whereas a game doesn't. A game, basically, you go straight in, you try something, you get instant feedback, you assimilate the instant feedback, you then do use that in the next activity that you do. Games are based on levels, they're based on uh, hierarchy, they're based on tasks, they're based on um, achievement. Um, but the whole thing is like flow. It's, it's all about um, don't yes. interrupt the flow yes. is one of the key things for games, right? And yet in learning and assessment, we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. We interrupt, the, we separate the learning from the feedback from the assessment. Mm -hmm. So we deliberately put in blocks by time and space for each of those. Right. Yep. So anyway, you've got, as I said, Kings Online will be able to help you with that. Yep. Yes. Uh, you talked about Moodle and it's perhaps not being the best as delivery output. Yep. Uh, I understand next year there'll be some updates, which will they be making what you do better? So in terms of what you're able to do, will it further enhance student experience when it comes to learning online? 
That is a big question mark. It really depends on what ultimately is done to improve Moodle. Um, one of the big things for me is that by default, Moodle doesn't have a great user experience. It's it, There's too much going on and you can't easily find um, focus in on what you need to do. It's not, I mean, for presenting content, you have a page or a book, and really it's just text, and maybe you have an image or a video. It's really boring, um, unless you, you really try and do something different with it to break it up or to, to make it a cohesive um, experience, basically. So I think there are things you can do to Moodle to make it a better experience for that. Um, I think they're all more complicated than and expensive, therefore, than we like to think about. Um, I'm hoping, yes, that if we can make Moodle a better experience by default, then we don't need quite as much of this external... Um, because, yeah, it's not always a great experience. You go to Moodle and then you have to click on something and go to a different interface in order to learn. I'd rather avoid that if we could. It's just can we? And it's a big question mark, and we will see, ultimately. Yes? Oh, sorry. Um, so you're talking a lot about how you're improving um, teacher-student interaction. Are you doing anything to improve student-to-student -student interaction within the classroom? Slowly, is the answer. Um, <laughs> we find, well, so Kings Online doesn't deal directly with students at all. So we are developing content which is then taught by the faculties. But obviously within that we want to improve, we want to, to help improve all of this. Um, we've tried, for instance, embedding forums into each of our learning activities so that students can ask each other questions um, and or have discussions within a learning activity rather than they have to then go back out and in. And, um, that's had varying results. Um, we're still exploring ways we can really improve this because clearly building engagement in online learning is vital and I don't know that anyone has completely cracked it yet. We out of time? My question was, yeah, I was, was going to say you went to the final questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.